Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and talk about some other aspects of ecology, specifically food chains, food webs, and some other feeding interactions. First off, a food chain is a series of steps in which organisms transfer energy by being eaten. If we take a look here, I'm going to highlight for you in red the pathway of this food chain. It goes from the algae all the way up to the alligator. That's the pathway. Each step is a trophic level. If I highlight those trophic levels for you in blue, these are the five trophic levels that are in this particular food chain. Food chains can contain more or less trophic levels. It just depends on what food chain you're talking about. Now, in this particular food chain, there are four interactions or four feedings happening. Once with the flagfish eating the algae, another time with a largemouth bass eating the flagfish, another time with the anhigla eating the largemouth bass, and another time with the alligator eating the anhigla. All of this makes up the food chain. Now notice that we have some things labeled with colors. Our primary producers, and those are the producers that make food first, remember, they make their own food using things from the environment and either sunlight or chemical energy. They don't consume anything. Our primary producers are algae. They then get eaten by the first consumer, which are herbivores. Those are organisms that eat only producers. And then we have three carnivores in this particular chain. A food chain is very simple though. Food webs are much more like what it is like in the environment. If we look at this food web, there's a lot more organisms going on. But we can probably still go up with some type of food web like we had before. Let's try to recreate it. So using the same color, I will attempt to recreate the food web. We had the algae that was eaten by the flagfish. And notice the direction of the arrow. I draw an arrow to the thing that consumes. Our first consumer is the flagfish. Then if you remember, the flagfish was eaten by a largemouth bass, and then the largemouth bass was eaten by an anhigla, and then the anhigla was eaten by an alligator. Notice that our previous food chain is included in this single food web. But of course, we're missing something. That's all the other interactions, because ecologists call a network of feeding interactions a food web. An example of it is right here. It's an Everglades food web. And it should have many, many branches going through it, because of course... It's a web. So what other interactions could we see? Well, first off, the algae itself could be eaten by another herbivore, grass shrimp and worms. Those could be eaten by a flagfish. They could also be eaten by a killifish, by crayfish. The crayfish could be eaten by a frog, potentially. Killfish could be eaten by the largemouth bass. The largemouth bass could be eaten by the alligator if it was able to get a hold of it. A vulture might eat a killfish, might eat a largemouth bass, might even eat an anhingla an an if it was dead. And so those are some of our interactions. Now, we could do more than that. The moorhen could be eating some of our algae as well. Notice that it's a green, as in a herbivore. A white-tailed deer could be in these plants. Whereas the moorhen. The raccoon is an omnivore, so it could be eating this, as well as our frog, as well as potentially a fish. Bobcat might eat the deer, the raccoon. But I, I doubt that it would get eaten by an alligator, but there's some potential that these two could uh, actually have some interactions there. And those are our consumer interactions. Notice it is a lot more complicated than what we just had before. We have all these different interactions and going. When we look at just a food chain, we're trying to simplify it. Look at one chain of interactions between organisms eating. This web has all kinds of things in it, but notice that we started with our original chain. If I go back to that, we can see it. It was algae to flagfish to largemouth bass to the anhigla over to our alligator. That was our original chain, our original chain. Now, let's take a look at some other feeding interactions, specifically the detritus pathway. We have these detritus decomposers here. Honestly, everything can go to that decomposer. If it dies, it's capable of going to the decomposer and being decomposed. That's the interesting thing about a food web is sometimes we choose to simplify them by not showing this particular interaction, but of course it can happen. All of these organisms can go to the detritus. So if I connect all these lines, and you get the point here, and I need my arrows 
going the correct direction. But that's our detritus interactions. And those decomposers are very important because remember, they're going to take and put energy back in the environment. That energy and some of the base nutrients is going to refeed our primary producers. So we end up with this really important cycle that we'll talk about later on in this chapter. But this is a food web. Remember, we started out with something very basic. We identified a single food chain in it. I expect you to be able to design your own food web, identify those interactions. I think it's fairly important. We look at another thing, specifically uh, a food web in an ocean. Again, we have all levels there. We have primary producers, and those primary producers are eaten by krill. Now, this herbivore krill becomes very important. It's very important because uh, these small swimming ankles, animals are zooplankton. Zoo, zoo this krill becomes very important because they eat these small organisms, zooplankton, and that's the base of this entire food chain. Notice, everything owes its own food to the krill at some point in some time. Everything. Even if you eat a penguin, you had to, the penguin had to eat the krill. So what would happen if the krill's population fell? Well, if the krill population was gone, then all of these feeding interactions wouldn't happen. Therefore, the upper level organisms wouldn't survive either. And so this is another example of a food web. It's showing you all of the interactions there. You follow the arrow. Remember, the arrow points towards the thing consuming. And you don't want to flip-flop your arrows when you're drawing your own. And if we cut out one specific thing in a food web, and in this example, it was the krill. If we cut out the krill, then we're in trouble. Of course, if we cut out the algae, we would be in trouble as well because they're the primary producers. The base of a food web is very, very important because it supplies all of the energies for everything above it. So let's talk about that base. We use ecological pyramids to show this information. It's relative amount of energy or matter contained within each trophic level in a given food chain or food web. I want to highlight this first one on the left, and that's the uh, energy pyramid. Notice that there's a lot of stuff going on here. First and foremost, we're talking about energy, and it's coming in the form of light or chemical. That should immediately tell you that this is photosynthesis or, or that it's happening with some primary producer. At the primary producer level, notice that there's 100% energy availability. That means all of the possible energy in the ecosystem is contained here at the primary producer level. If we go up to the first consumer, however, notice that there's 10% of the original energy there. So only 10% was able to go from the primary producer to the first level consumer. And we can also call those first level consumers herbivores. Where did the rest of it go? We have to remember that those primary producers build their body. They're using energy that they make. So a lot of it comes out as heat. We talk about the rule of 10%. Each time you go up a trophic level, only 10% of the previous energy can pass there. So if we go back to our original food web, then our first level, let me go back there for a moment, our first level is algae. That means that the algae will have 100% of the energy. After the flagfish eats it, only 10% is left. After the largemouth bass eats it, only 1% is left. When the anhinga gets it, there is 0.1% left, which means there's not even a percentage. And by the time the alligator is eating it, there is 0.01%. And this should tell you something about how much food each one of these has to consume because, you know, the, the flagfish gets a decent amount of energy from the algae. But by the time you get to the alligator, it probably has to eat quite a bit because it's not getting as much of the original energy. It's always best to get the energy early on. But that's our rule of 10, that each trophic level you go up, you're going to lose 90% of your energy to heat. And that's building biomass, using the energy that you've got. As we go up this, we see the heat's there, and that each level of these trophic levels, we're going to lose more and more energy. In the biomass pyramid, and this is specific with the numbers, what we find is that the vast majority of the biomass is down at the bottom. Most of the biomass is right here. As you go up, remember that only 10% of the energy actually goes with you. 
So only 10% of that energy goes with you, which tends to mean that the amount of biomass at that second level was much smaller. So you notice here we have uh, two, four, six, eight organisms being supported by this one field. So this is our first level consumers, which will be our herbivores. If we go up another trophic level, remember that only 1% of the original energy is going there. And notice that the amount of organisms has decreased. Now we see only five snakes. And by the time we get to the top on this biomass pyramid, there's a lot less biomass, and that's because only 0.1% of energy is being moved up there. But focus on the biomass. There's only one hawk for all of that biomass below there. And that's because it takes so much biomass to support that hawk. You're the same way. You take a lot of nutrients and a lot of biomass to support you. If all you ever ate in your one life was, you know, 10 ears of corn, you wouldn't be here. You would have starved. Because you need a lot of calories, a lot of energy. And that's because of your positioning. You're up here. You're on top of the food pyramid. Top of the food chain. Nothing eats you, and so depending on what you eat, it, it can adjust how much you need to eat.